Welcome to Exhibition. And hello, John Bockor. Hello, Richard. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to talk to you again. It is great to see you again. Um, and your exhibition uh, is titled Inner World at King Street Gallery on William in Sydney. Um, and actually, just looking at you now, you're very much in your own world. Uh, it looks as though you're sitting in a room of your own painting. But what is it that you've got behind you? I, I presume it's a work. Yeah, this, um, this is a work in progress. So it's, um, it's nowhere near completion yet. Uh, but it's, it's started on the journey. So I, I usually, um, with these larger interiors, um, I start with an image or a, um, or a few images, and um, I start to sort of create a room. Um, I sort of start with a basic outline of the room, um, usually from one image, and then I like to kind of add things in and radically change things as well. So um, uh, like in this one behind me, uh, the bookcase existed. Um, the chair and the couch didn't really look like that. And there wasn't the two windows. So I'm kind of in the middle of constructing what it could be out the window, you know, so I've been thinking about that today. <laughs> so you are in a sense, really creating your own universe, your own uh, micro universe of a room, starting with the bare bones of, uh, of something that you've seen somewhere and then creating your own virtual space. That's it. Yeah, that's, that's what I've been doing. And I wanted to make something, I, I guess I wanted to make something myself rather than have it dictated to me. Um, and that's something that, in a funny way, that's something that I've done in my still life painting for forever, ever since I started doing it. Something about the idea of just having a flat table with things on it meant that it didn't matter where the things were or if you took them out, replaced them with other things. So in the paintings, often I'll set up a still life and I'll start painting it and I'll hate the composition. And so I'll, I'll take some of the objects out and I'll put something else in that might just be over here rather than in the still life. And, um, or I'll, I'll just make something up. I'll think, oh, well, what about a big plate there, you know? Or what about if I put a book there and I'll look over there and I've got a book lying somewhere and I'll think, oh, what's the cover of that look like? And I'll start putting that in. Um, and so I've always done that in my still life. It's always been like a game, like a jigsaw of mm -hmm. things just moving around. One of the uh, things that uh, certainly seems to happen with the interiors is that they are rich with detail, what appears to be detailed observation, but may, from what you've described, be detailed creation, uh, yeah. where, where you are interested in everything, you know, the surface, the carpet, the furniture, the art on the walls, the, the light fittings, you know, you create every mm. part of, of the world. And yet in the still lives, often there seems very little interest in the background. Everything is about the objects on the table most of the time. Can you compare the two for us? Everyone's got duality in them, you know, um, that you can be a really neat person, you're very tidy, but then you like to cut loose and go, go nuts, you know. Um, or you, you're very law-abiding, but sometimes you like to do something a little bit dangerous, you know? Um, and to me, there are kind of duality. Sometimes I really want to, um, I really want to get stuck into the interiors because I want to create my own world. And sometimes I like the, the kind of destruction that happens in still lives. I usually start by putting too many things in and then um, destroying things, getting rid of things until it's, until it's an interesting composition. Um, I, wanted to, so I wanted to ask you about uh, that process, if, if I may, that process yeah. of covering things over, but mm -hmm. leaving 
ghosts or palimpsests fairly clearly behind. In other words, you, you don't, when you destroy, you don't destroy completely. You don't remove the memory altogether. Often there's a, a, a shadow or a line or, or part of mm. a painted form. Why do you like to leave us with the history of what's gone before? I love the history and the marks in a painting. Um, there's so much about the material is the sort of material aspect of, of of working in paint that I love, and one of them is is just all the the huge amount of marks you can make, and they're all you know they're all different. Um, but also, I I love to go and have a look at other people's work and work out how they made it, and you know what changes they made and things like that, and. If I can see the changes in my own work, it doesn't make me unhappy. It makes, it, it sort of gives me a bit of joy that I can, uh, you know, I can see that that changed from that to this. And, you know, isn't that, there's the exciting possibility that there's a bit of that left and the history of it is still there because mm -hmm. um, I'm, a, I'm a very hard marker when it comes to my own work. You know, um, if, like there wouldn't be, any paintings in the show that I haven't painted over a few times, mostly um, I'll paint over something three or four times because I'm just, there's so many possibilities that it could be. And if I didn't have a show coming up, I'd probably just keep going with them, um, which is possibly not a great thing, but, and I try to, I try to let things live sometimes but because um, I'm often taking photos of things in various stages and I'll look back through the photos and I'll think, that was all right. Why didn't I leave that? That was fine, you know. <laughs> 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 um, I could have had two paintings here and I've only got one. Yeah. When, um, uh, when you decide to, to work and continuing to work over and you leave, as we've said, that, uh, that evidence of the past, the palimpsests uh, there, does that happen as much in the the larger interior works as it does and has done for so long with your still life work and particularly your drawings yeah yeah it does it does it happens a lot um mostly like the larger paintings of mine whether they be still lifes or or interiors um they're often going they're often going for months um I, or, all the large paintings in the in the show at King Street now, I um, I started them more than a year ago. They were started pre-COVID times, um, and then you know they 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 finished off um, recently. So um, I've always got a lot of things around the studio that are half finished, nearly finished, um, on the way to being finished. Maybe I think it's finished, but it's not really finished. You know, that sort of thing. They're always hanging around. And I like to just move through and work on one and then the other and then the other and, and go through them without finishing anything off for a long, long time. That's sort of how I get a show together. There are quite a, a, a number of drawings in this exhibition. Um, and one of yeah. the things uh, about uh, that developing history, that visible history that you've talked about in the works, applies particularly to the drawings because of the, the elements of collage that you bring in. Not mm -hmm. only are there layers of marks, but there are literally layers of paper, new parts of paper that, that you put on. Um, yeah. Why is that process important to you and what does it allow you to do with the work? Um, it allows me to work with a safety net in that um, I can completely cut loose in a drawing and try anything I like because in the end, if it fails, I can put a section of new paper over the top and redraw it or continue on some other thought in the drawing that might work better. and. Um, uh, if it gets too busy, too detailed, I can just blank it out and draw something that's a bit simpler over the top, things like that. So, um, 
So I don't feel like I, I in the same way when I, when you paint, you can always scrape it off. You can always paint over it. If it gets too built up, you can let it fully dry. Then you can sand it back. You can scrape it down, you know, and then you can, you can rework it. Um, and I wanted that in drawing. I wanted to be able to keep a drawing going. I like the fracturing you get from it um, in the same way that, you know, cubist space is, is kind of fractured. Um, I, I like that. You can, you can throw things right forward that, that aren't supposed to be. And, you know, and you can push things right back and you can, you can, you can disrupt the flow of lines and things like that, which, um, you know, which has a lot of, a lot of potential. The exhibition title is Inner World, but how much in terms of the works that we see uh, is this actually your world? How much are these works an insight into your, your personal space and your, your personal um, environment, I guess? You know, is, for example, the work Breakfast Table, is that your breakfast table? Yeah, are we seeing your biscuit tin and your teapot? Are we seeing you? Quite often, quite often. But more you're seeing my wife. She, you know, <laughs> she's the one who has, uh, who has very good taste in, uh, in ceramics and cups and plates and things like that. You know, they're, they're lovely everyday things that we use all the time. And that's what mainly the still lifes are made up of, out of. And they do seem, some of them seem to be objects that uh, have actually occurred and recurred in your exhibitions over the years, not just this one. There's, there's quite a richness of history in that continuity of works. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, there's some that, uh, you know, I've been, I've been putting them in still life since 2003, something, you know, 17 years worth of... Uh, worth of little little sugar jug or something, you know, that, uh, that I adore. You know, there's a few things that just have these patterns on them that I just, I love painting. So, um, uh, so I'm always, always tempted to put them in something because I really enjoy the, uh, the marks that it takes to, to make that. Can we turn now to um, uh, the paint and the palette and particularly the development of, uh, of the colours that you're using over the years. They seem to have, in recent years, really intensified in energy and brightness of colour. What's happening there? I really don't know. I would love to give you a, 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 an answer that, that made a lot of sense. Um, but I have always approached colour completely intuitively. I get to a point in mixing a colour that I want to put somewhere and I'll start adding, you know, some red to it or something like that. And when it gets to a, per a certain point, I'll just go, ah, stop, that's it. And, I, and I'll put that down. And that'll be the colour I was looking for. But the decisions that you make seem to result in colours that are extraordinarily bright and extraordinarily intense without necessarily mm. reflecting on any theories perhaps just emotionally, why do you think that's the case? Is that a, it's, it's clearly a choice that you make. It is a choice, it's, but it, it, it's something that, that happened without, you know, it's, it's like when you, when you put on weight or something, you know, it's something that happens without, without you really realizing it until one day you say, oh my God, I don't fit into these swimmers anymore. <laughs> these, these were loose on me the other day, you know, the last year. They, I'm sure they were loose, you know. Um, it, it's a bit like that. So I was, um, I was always interested in colour. I was always using colour. But I guess I wasn't using it to the same extent. But you get, I don't know, you get, you get bolder. You get more... Um, uh, yeah, you get you get bolder at, at at what you're doing. You get more confident, I guess, and um, and you start mixing colours together that that shock you a little bit, but you want to use them anyway. Um, One of the uh, elements that perhaps links to that is that most of the works, one way or another, but particularly uh, the interiors, seem to be a tremendous celebration of light. Um, is that something that again you you specifically try to capture? 
Yeah, I love light in, in paintings. I like shadows. I'm really, um, you know, when I look at other people's work, uh, I love it when you have a good long shadow in something, you know? <laughs> and I love the colors that, that shadows can be. I remember when I was at art school, I saw this, um, this painting that uh, Van Gogh did that um, uh, it had sort of shadows falling across a path and there were these sort of purples and these greys and all these colours that made up the shadow uh, and I thought wow shadows can be so exciting you know I was 17 years old and I thought to myself shadows are just this kind of muddy black you know until I saw things like that and so it's interesting when you you know when you see paintings especially paintings from history you know you wonder whether the painting of that certain light condition came first or whether that it actually occurred in nature. You know what I mean? Like whether you, because you'd seen the painting, you then notice it in nature or did you notice it in nature first and then seen the, and then you saw the painting. Mm -hmm. um, it, it makes you sort of wonder which way it went. You know, if, when you see uh, the European painters and they put uh, these sort of purpley shadows, bluey purple shadows on snow, you know, and you think, oh, isn't that wonderful? And then you see that in the snow, you think, oh, isn't that gorgeous? You know, <laughs> I wonder would I have noticed that so much if I if I hadn't seen the paintings? Yeah, yeah. I'd like to um, conclude our conversation today um, uh, by going to, in fact, one of the, the smaller works or a couple of the of the of the smaller works, and, and looking yeah. at that intersection between drawing and painting. Um, if we look yeah. at something like uh, Yellow Still Life, there's clear evidence of a, a lot of the drawn mark there as well as the paint. Yeah. water jug and pencils is another example. Um, how, how does your drawing inform how you paint or does it? Yeah, look, drawing has always been something that is like a driving force to all the work that I do. Um, and it's always included. If, um, if I want to make a change in a painting, I draw it in first. I've always got um, lots of pencils hanging on the bottom of my easel. Um, and so I'm always scraping paint off and then redrawing things uh, and then painting them back in again. And that's sort of, that's sort of the way I, I work. Scrape, redraw, paint back in. And I started to enjoy seeing these funny lines of drawing mixed in with the paint and underneath the paint and, you know, coming through by themselves in some areas. Um, and I became more kind of cavalier about them. I didn't cover them over as much or if, or if I did a little bit of drawing over to one side and I never, I never completely finished that. And it was just some lines. I'm, kind of quite happy with that too because I think to myself well it's primarily a painting but it doesn't mean it has to entirely be a painting and in the same way those little um those little drawings that I do which I, I put a little bit of paint in you know the sort of color note drawings um they're the same thing well why does it have to just be a drawing why can't I have a bit of paint in it or you know why can't a painting have a bit of drawing in it do we have to have them you know, one or the other, what's, you know, what's that about? Why do, you, why do we have to be one or the other? It just seems to be some sort of weird construct that we've had over, over time that um, these are paintings, these are drawings, these are sculpture, you know, and, um, and to mix them all up is, it's kind of a nice thing. I like the freedom of it. Well, enjoy that freedom uh, and uh, we will enjoy seeing the examples of it in your current exhibition. So, John Bockel, thanks for sharing your exhibition with us. Thank you very much, Richard.